I'm super excited to be sitting across from Derek Edwards. He's um, Emeritus Professor of Psychology in the Department of Social Sciences at Loughborough University. Derek, thank you very much for agreeing to do a dark eye interview today. Cheers. Um, <coughs> may I start by asking you about your early days here at Loughborough and your memories from um, the time you came to work here? Yeah. It's a long time ago now, 1974, believe it or not. Um, and I almost didn't come here, actually. I was uh, applying for jobs in developmental and cognitive psychology, which is my area. Mm -hmm. And I didn't apply for this one. It was advertised as social psychology. And I wasn't a social psychologist. I didn't bother applying for it. But uh, one of my tutors, uh, I bumped into him and he, he told me that in fact they wanted someone to teach language here, language and thought, that, mm. and that maybe I could apply. So I discovered it, I was already past the closing date. It's another reason I didn't, almost didn't come. <laughs> I applied anyway and I got interviewed and I got the job, so I almost wasn't here. Wow. Um, I was employed, in fact, to teach this new course. There was a new degree starting in social psychology in an interdisciplinary department, which included sociology at that time. Uh, it was quite a small department. And my main job was to teach a new course, which I then had to write and teach, called Thought and Language, mm -hmm. which I taught right up until the day I retired. Wow. And then it ended. So the, my career and that course were simultaneous. And that course included things on language and thinking, developmental and cognitive psychology, psycholinguistics, linguistics, all kinds of things. And eventually it got uh, more and more, in the course, I say, got more and more interested in discursive psychological kinds of themes. Mm -hmm. For some reason I can't imagine. <laughs> Maybe it's because I was teaching it. Uh, so it, it was more than 10 years after I had arrived that uh, Mick Billig came here and then after him Jonathan Potter. So dog didn't exist until after that. Mm -hmm. But during those times it was just me in the Department of Social Sciences. I started a couple of collaborative research projects mm -hmm. with people outside the department. David Middleton, mm -hmm. who is in another department here and Neil Mercer, who at that time was in, at the Open University. And we were analysing audio and video recorded interactions. Mm -hmm. So, um, basically, as far as DOG and the later development of DOG type things at Loughborough were concerned, I was here for some time before that began. And I was interested already in some of the topics we continued with, mm -hmm. um, language and its relation to psychology um, and the analysis of uh, naturally occurring mm -hmm. um, social interaction and talk. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I should say though is that uh, how fortunate I was to come to this department because the Department of Social Sciences, being new and interdisciplinary, and being not a psychology department, meant that I had a lot of freedom in the interests I was able to develop, the research and the teaching I was able to do. And I think it's quite possible that had I found myself given a job in a mainstream psychology department, I'd never have developed my part of discursive psychology at least. In fact, I'd probably never have published anything because I'd have, I'd have had to send things to high-impact mainstream psychology journals uh, who were not very uh, receptive to what I wanted to do. So I'm, I'm pleased to have come to Loughborough University, to this department, uh, under the, um, the head of department then was Albert Churns, who had founded an interdisciplinary department of social science, and it was a lovely place to work. That's why I never moved. Whether anyone else would have me, I don't know, but I, I never moved because it, it became the place I wanted to be. Wow. Yeah. 
You mentioned um, that before coming here you were interested in cognitive psychology and developmental psychology. Yes. Was that related to your PhD? Yes. Um, uh, my PhD was on the development of language in children and I had got interested in infant cognition and language as part of my undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. And I started, in fact, reading, immersing myself in linguistics. I found linguistics to be much more useful for what I wanted to do than psychology was at that time. Um, I set off, I, I designed four experiments. <laughs> I got my grant to do four <laughs> experiments on children and cognition and language, and I never ran those experiments because I, I had a kid <laughs> and I got interested in what my daughter was doing and saying. I started recording it and it became much more interesting. I started making transcriptions and then I got another couple of kids from elsewhere and uh, started recording them. And so my thesis became a study of the spontaneous speech of kids at home with their parents. And it became that kind of situated, uh, recorded, um, basis for examining the development of language. Mm -hmm. It soon became clear to me that my initial interest in grammar and syntax and how those things developed was just missing what was going on. What was going on was kind of more messy, more complex, more interesting. And it was the nexus of social relations, social interaction, and how what children were doing was learning how to do things with words as John Austin would put it. And so that became the direction of my interests. So I arrived here with a ready-made interest in language, cognition, and the analysis of recordings of social interaction as the basis for studying those things. I should say also, doing my PhD, my supervisor, Roger Goodwin, was very knowledgeable about linguistics and cognitive psychology and so on. Um, but I had no idea how to study situated social action, how to record it, how to transcribe it, how to analyze it. I, I just made it up. I, I, I had no idea at that time that uh, people such as Sachs and Shegloff were doing something which would have been useful to me in California. Not only were they on the other side of the world, but they were sociologists. And I'd never heard of them. You know, I, I didn't know what I was doing, really. I, I was just recording, transcribing, trying to put kids' noises into phonetic symbols and looking at it and trying to figure out what was going on. So it's quite exciting, but a bit scary at the same time. Anyway, that was my PhD. Wow. <laughs> yeah. um, you kind of continued looking at kids, but older kids, uh, uh, pupils in the classroom, in your project, um, in your collaboration with Neil Mercer, mm -hmm. um, one of the results was the book um, Common Knowledge. Yes. How did that project uh, come about? Well, we're now in the uh, late 1970s. For, for a while, between the late 1970s and around 1985 or 86, which is when Mick and Jonathan started arriving here, mm -hmm. I was working on two collaborative projects, one with Neil Mercer mm -hmm. on classroom education and the other with David Middleton on conversational remembering. Mm -hmm. And so those projects were getting going. With Neil, uh, with both Dave and Neil, I met them at conferences. <laughs> and uh, with Neil, he stayed at my house on the way back, because it was so late by the time we got home. And he saw that I had a guitar and started playing it. And uh, we found we enjoyed playing the guitar together, you know. We became friends, and so we had to think of something we might do. We, we were both <laughs> interested in language and psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, so both Neil and Dave uh, were people I started working with separately. And both of them had been involved in studies of child development or of language, basically from an experimental kind of point of view. And both of them fancied doing the, uh, the kinds of social interaction and recorded language kinds of studies that I'd been doing. And so, because Neil was working at the Open University in an education department, we decided the project we would do would be based on video recordings of classroom mm -hmm. 
education, looking at how it worked, basically. And with Dave, it was uh, collecting recordings of people remembering things together, including uh, families who would record themselves looking through collections of family holiday photos and talking about them. Um, so that's how those projects began, and they were, yeah, they were both also important um, grounds for what, from my point of view, eventually became discursive psychology, in that they were looking at uh, situated collaborative talk, and the interest that we had in them was more or less psychological. It was how does knowledge develop in the classroom? Mm -hmm. How do kids publicly come to show what they know? Mm -hmm. How do teachers teach? Uh, can this be examined in some detail? And, and it was a, a non-psychological way of looking at it. We didn't want to look at, for instance, or ask a question, what do kids understand? Or what do kids learn? Or whatever it would be. It was, how is classroom education done in a way so that kids, whatever kids know can be seen, and whatever kids know can be shown? Mm -hmm. uh, so how is, we, we considered education to be a public process. It's got to be. So what is that public process, rather than what is the private process of, say, uh, having an understanding? Um, in fact, that, that was somewhat related to readings I did later of Harvey Sachs and his lectures, where Sachs has a lovely formulation of the psychology of understanding, of comprehension, um, and he describes something that looks a bit like a, a memory experiment where you give people some materials and later you ask them to recall them and you look at the difference between the materials you gave them and the things they recall and you can infer processes of what they understand, what is their comprehension, what is their memory. And all of those things are supposedly things going on inside their heads. And I'm sure there are things going on inside their heads. But what Sachs suggested was a different question and that is, do people have ways of showing that they understand something and that they're being understood. In other words, if you take a, a kind of Wittgensteinian view of so-called mental processes mm -hmm. and you consider them essentially, necessarily, publicly available, mm -hmm. and Wittgenstein argues they have to be somewhat publicly available in order that we can learn the language for describing them, then if you treat things in that way, can you discover by observation the ways people have, have of showing that they've been understood. Mm -hmm. In conversation analysis, it, that comes down to looking at the succession of terms in which people display an understanding of prior terms, and they have available the mechanisms of repair by which they can uh, deal with possible misunderstandings and so on. And so there is a machinery of understanding which is public, and I found that very inspirational. But in, in a way, that's what Neil and I were doing in uh, classrooms. Um, not that Neil was fond of ethnomethodology or CA, he never was, but uh, from my point of view, I can see that as the interest I wanted to take in it. How are those things publicly displayed through embodied action and talk? And that was available on video recordings. The work I was doing at that time with Dave and with Neil was also the beginning of the interest in what we later called subject-object relations, mm -hmm. which is to say uh, the relationship between the world or a version of the world and a person's psychological states such as what they think, feel or remember of it. And that's a central theme of discursive psychology. But for instance, the, in the classrooms, the kind of thing I was most interested in was when you'd have the kids were working on some classroom project. They were doing, for instance, a kind of replication of Galileo's experiments with pendulums. And the lesson was structured so that the kids constructed their pendulums and uh, made observations. And they could see for themselves, do it for themselves. This is classic learning by doing. Mm -hmm. It would be 
absolutely compatible and an embodiment of Piagetian learning. And they were finding, they were varying things like the weight of the bob at the end of the pendulum string and measuring the time it took for the pendulum to swing. And they were making notes of these things. And at the same time, the teacher was hovering around and making uh, comments and so on. But the interesting thing for me was that it was the relationship between what the kids seemed to be seeing and what they would initially say that they saw and what eventually became to be, came to be the kind of official version of what had happened. Mm -hmm. And the official version eventually was uh, a replication of the classic physics of pendulums cast in the language of the physics of pendulums mm -hmm. with you know, mass and uh, various other things concepts used. And so the interesting thing was how do, you, how do children go from their direct action and experience of the world into being able to talk physics? Right? Being able to see what they're supposed to see. Being able to discover as if for themselves what in fact the curriculum's already mapped out that they should be finding. Mm -hmm. And that was a fascinating thing to look at and also was the fact that the teacher was bringing off this kind of learning process as discovery learning, as the kids learning it for themselves. So officially it was not direct instruction. The teacher could have spent five minutes telling them the physics of pendulums, didn't do that, spent three weeks having them construct pendulums, take measurements, observe things and so on. And so the, the emphasis was on how the kids learn things for themselves without being directly taught. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of uh, examination of what it takes. It's the kind of the socialization of language and understanding mm -hmm. in the classroom mm -hmm. so that kids can eventually get counted as having learned the right stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, my interest. So that, that notion of, say, subject-object relations is embodied in that. The, the object being the pendulum and its movements and so on, and the subject side being, well, what do you make of that? Mm -hmm. Were those measurements different or the same? Were they within a margin of error? Um, which of the three variables is the one that counts? Mm -hmm. And those things, in the end, they all got learned. You know. So that was, that was fascinating in that world, I think. Absolutely.